Welcome to the Spawn Chunks, episode number 260 for Monday, August 28th. Holy crap, where did August go? It's still 2023, but summer is evaporating. My name is Joel Duggan, and joining me as always is my friend Johnny, but you may know him better as Pixel Riffs on the interwebs. Hello, sir. Hello, and I'm trying to make the most of summer by going on a cycling trip next week, so you may be hearing something completely different in the co-hosting chair next time around. Uh, but we've had some yeah, unfortunate incidents with bicycles today which needed an immediate fix, so we've kept the render distance this week short and sweet. We might have a little bit of a post-show chat, but the pre-show is just straight down to business this time around. But if you're interested in hearing the render distance more frequently, if you want a, a little bit of top and tail added to the show every week where Joel and I talk about what's going on in our lives and what we've been into lately you can get that from patreon.com slash the spawn chunks we've got a bunch of patron events that happen on a monthly basis we've had monthly minecraft hangouts recently our quarterly hangout has been pushed to the third quarter of the year so that we can accommodate a few changes to that and of course the chunk mail dispenser was last week so thank you to our patrons for as always keeping the uh, patron support going so we can focus on the community every once in a while for now though let's focus on us joel what's new on the citadel this week I spent the week finishing up the courtyard in the West Hill Keep. Uh, so I took the opportunity to go around and add the details that I was adding on the top of the ramparts and add them along the outside wall of the uh, the courtyard. And it's one of the things that really helps make the keep feel a lot more complete now that I'm walking through that courtyard quite a bit and on all sides, everything has kind of been detailed out. I added a bunch of like barrels and things, just kind of uh, things that might look like there are supplies that just don't have anywhere else to go at the moment. I added a rain gutter as if like rainwater collecting on the top of the rampart would be problematic. So you'd want it to drain down the wall. And it was for no other reason other than just to have something in that corner to make it look cool. And uh, I like that you can waterlog stairs and have like a, a quarter block square of water visible. So like it kind of lets you know what's going on without like a giant one meter wide waterfall coming out of your out of your um, your wall, which is really cool. And I, uh, I was going around and adding other details inside the entrances to all of the towers and staircases. So like when you enter in a tower to go upstairs, there's like a crate or barrel or something in that space. Because like that space would probably be utilized for something storage somehow. Uh, I started hanging things like bows and swords on the walls with the armor statues data pack shelves with things on them using the... Um, uh, the, the trading data pack that I mentioned before, the wandering trades for different blocks that are, are mini block heads. So like mini beehives, even just mini blocks of planks look like boxes of stuff that you can kind of like just be strewn around um, the grounds. I think my favorite addition is adding the texturing and the detailing around the small stables. So I've got water in the troughs. I've got uh, the tripwire hooks were already there for um, like where you might um, hook up a horse, but then adding hay bales piled up against the wall and then adding sand and birch, um, stripped birch logs and sandstone into the actual floor of the courtyard to make it look like maybe some hay or dust has been just kind of strewn around. Uh, that's pr probably my favorite corner. And then I topped everything up with a redesign of uh, the guardhouse that I wasn't happy with. Uh, I looked for a, a you know before picture, but I, I know I've shared one, but I couldn't find one today. And it used to be deep slate with a very standard kind of triangle dark oak roof. And I've switched it back to stone and stone brick. And then I trimmed off the edges of the, um, the roof. So it's a little bit smaller. And I added in some uh, logs to kind of help make it a little bit more of a frame and have it stand out a little bit more as a unique thing and so i'm really happy with that uh, the inside isn't done uh, because we're still waiting on a couple of things there and the last thing i did was run around and make sure that all of the lights that were high up on the keep were soul lanterns and then all of the lights that were down below at courtyard level were more of the regular lanterns and the result is a very cool vibe when you are up high looking at the keep from another tower in this in the town or something like that, you can see like the warm glow of the courtyard. But when you're walking around in the streets, you can just see the cool blue glow of 
the soul lanterns on the tops of all the towers and the walls so it has like a very like cool almost intimidating top with like a warm inviting lower ground which i found was a kind of a happy accident but i leaned into it and it really worked out well and so i'm quite happy with with the way that that turned out yeah the um the soul lanterns look like the kind of thing that like a night watchman on the walls might have and it's sort of like a hooded lantern that they yeah. can look down a little bit but they're trying not to give away their positions in case the enemy is like totally. sneaking up and snipe them from the walls with a bow and arrow or something so yeah i think the vibe there really successful the night screenshots you've got in here really do look like very atmospheric and the town looks inviting while the keep looks a little bit more guarded which obviously works very well for the the keep as a structure Thanks. Yeah, it's it's really coming along. And uh, I, I still have a few things left to do, but all of them inside the keep hinge on me deciding what's going to happen with the tables and chairs, whether I'm going to move ahead with the tables and chairs data pack or find a mod or, or something else that allows me to then uh, do those kind of things in Minecraft. So uh, more on that later in the main discussion. But for now, the keep is pretty much done as far as its structure. It's more about like the inside stuff. Uh, that has to get detailed out but I'm quite happy with it from the outside I think the only thing left is the west tower which is that tall tall tower uh, that does not have any lights on it and I, I'm keeping it that way I think I like that iconic kind of just straight uh, asymmetrical uh, piece to the keep but I, I have not decided how I'm going to texture it I don't want to do the standard andesite on the bottom stone on the top because on the west side I've used a lot of andesite at the bottom and I don't want there to be like i want there to be a distinct difference between the tower and the surrounding walls of the keep so i'm going to try to figure out something it uh it's gonna be a pain though because it's really tall because the keep is on a hill and that tower is one of the things that goes all the way down to river level which is like y63 or mm -hmm. something so the tower itself on the other side is like 60 blocks tall or something so whenever yeah. whatever i decide to do that for texture it's just gonna be a lot of up and down on a lot of scaffolding that i'm not looking forward to yeah yeah i bet i bet well yeah I, I relate to your struggles with interior stuff and i know it's just something that you're you know kind yeah. of getting around to but i have not done a great deal of interior stuff for anything in the survival guide world yet and it's primarily a time thing because i've been backlogging episodes for my pc's absence and then again backlogging episodes for this trip to europe that i haven't really had a chance to focus on anything except small maybe like mechanics and segments of the game that i can easily explain in a short amount of time and then produce a short video about that and i i just don't have the time to sort of settle in and go right like let, let me either plan some stuff out in creative and just kind of do the the fiddly trial and error stuff of making everything look right or go in in survival and work with okay what blocks do i have where do i want the details to be and do everything from like you know ground level and play a scale so yeah i i expect once i'm maybe like coasting towards late autumn and winter i'll probably start coming back and doing all of the detail stuff because i'll be less bogged down with trying to figure out mechanics that i can explain in a in a shortish amount of time i imagine that's going to be challenging too like when you're trying to do tutorials but then the builder inside wants to kind of take over and, and perhaps spend longer in an area than perhaps the tutorial really needs you know yeah. because you want to decorate it or or, or do things like that because I, kn I know that I have absolutely you know thought I'm going to do three things today and I do one because mm -hmm. creatively I'm just like zoned in on something and I'm nitpicking and moving barrels a block to the left or a block to the right you know that kind of thing or fiddling with armor stands and data packs that kind of stuff yeah it's it's one of the reasons working in creative mode more to plan stuff has been so helpful to me in formulating what i'm going to do in an episode because then at least i i go in with a plan and most of the trial and error is faster in creative mode because i don't have to spend so much time breaking and placing stuff with like normal tool break times and that kind of thing and or worrying about durability even um so yeah it, it's it's been nice to cut out a lot of the time from just doing stuff in creative and then building stuff in survival with screenshots and whatnot so i'll probably approach it the same way there and at least that way because i know what i'm doing the first time around i'm not explaining stuff on the fly and it doesn't feel as much like an improvised way of doing things i can rationalize a lot of my decisions and so i can explain them a lot better 
when it comes to making a video about it. But you're right, like the the amount of times I can make a tutorial about a house in this series before people go, wait, we've we've had house tutorials before. We know how to build houses at this point, but I need to build more houses so that an area looks more filled out and that like it's an actual community. So yeah, the, the tutorial aspect of it is going to rub up against the desire to build, which is still pretty strong. Um, in the meantime, I've had a desire to explore, though, and partly kind of prompted by um, thinking about the Caves and Cliffs update more recently, I went exploring underneath the mountain that is the kind of central, uh, you know, figurehead oh, cool. of the Survival Guide series, the Cherry Blossom Mountain with the ice on the top. And I noticed early on that it had a dripstone cave underneath it. So I thought I'll go down there, I can grab some dripstone, uh, talk about like, you know, lava renewal mechanics and that kind of stuff further down the line, talk about converting mud into clay, all of the kind of stuff that that uh, tier of material kind of unlocks. And as I was exploring under the mountain, first of all, it has one of those really incredible, like, chains dangling from the ceiling, abandoned mine shafts, which I love. Like, I, ever since I saw those in the snapshots for the Caves and Cliffs terrain changes, I just went, wow, this is a new way to experience abandoned mine shaft, and it's so cool looking. But then below that, I spotted a patch of skulk, and so I thought, oh cool, I can introduce a little bit of skulk and tell people about the deep dark, we're not going to go there right away, zoomed in on it with my spyglass, looked directly at the structures of an ancient city, and went, well, I'm going to be biting off more than I can chew fairly soon, <laughs> I imagine. Wow. Um, so yeah, I, it turns out there's an ancient city underneath my starter area, not exactly world spawn, but the area that I've been building all of my, my early game stuff. So, That's awesome. Yeah, bookmarking that for later on. Um, but obviously, <laughs> obviously, I wanted to pair the Dripstone Cave with a visit to a lush cave as well. So I found a really nice lush cave, which incidentally also led to a deep dark biome, if not actually an ancient city. So yeah, there's a few of them. Uh, there's a few of them around. But I was able to get a bunch of resources from those locations and uh, starting to, again, fill in the gaps in my... Uh, massive storage system that I built fairly recently. So dripstone has a place there, so does moss, so does clay, you know, the kind of stuff that you can gather from those biomes in bulk. Um, but then I'm sort of turning my attention to early game farms, and again this is uh, short-ish mechanics that I can explain within, you know, a an hour and a half or so of recording. Uh, maybe a little bit more time in case of the latter two, because the first thing was an amethyst geode, which I waterlogged entirely, made a tank out of it, cut everything out except the budding amethyst blocks, and now we can float around that tank with a fortune pickaxe gathering shards and letting them float to the surface. Eventually I'm going to come back there with allays, since they are also related to amethyst in the sense that you can duplicate them with amethyst shards, but if they're not listening to a jukebox at the time, you can have them hold an amethyst shard and then they can collect the ones that float to the surface surface for me instead of having to worry about like running water streams over the top of a tank of water which leads to just some really awkward water collision mechanics that aren't the best to play around with um so yeah that, that was the first thing i did this week was uh set up this amethyst geode farm which i think is going to be quite rewarding it gives me tinted glass um it, it keeps i keep being reminded of new th stuff that has been added to amethyst since it was introduced like we also have calibrated skulk sensors now which once we've been to the deep dark i can start talking about and allay duplication and you know amethyst blocks are going to be nice to work with the clusters are going to be nice to work with i think it's it's good to have some of that stuff from an early stage and earlier i think than most players would want to be messing around this much with amethyst geodes but i'm sort of laying in a few things for for later on in the guide so with the amethyst geode being a tank, do you do you find that you prefer that over like mining it off and having it f drop into a water stream or uh, even just doing it manually as you like walk around different scaffolding and, and collect it? Yeah, it's just the height thing, I think. Like the scaffolding yeah. becomes a burden after a while, especially with, mm. you know, the amount people tend to drop off of scaffolding blocks or other things. Like I find myself doing that too. And it's so difficult to get all of all six faces of every block in a geode from you know whatever arrangement of scaffolding and the geode i found is quite large it's one of the larger ones that i've been able to track down so i really wanted there to be a holistic way to get a 360 degree you know spherical uh, view of of every block in here and so i decided yeah the the tank approach has worked for me in the past and it is worth fortuning them. I know there are definitely automatic ways that you can harvest some of these. The most successful of which I've seen was a, um, a style cooked up by the Psycraft guys that Doc M used in Hermitcraft, where you effectively have a cutout of a wall that is propelled by a series of slime and honey block flying machines, which 
goes in from one side of the geode, crosses the room, doubles back on itself, and then, you know, exits into the wall that it came from. And then one from the, you know, you do that on the uh, X axis, and then you do another one on the Z axis, and then a third machine comes down from the roof and then repeats, sort of doubles back from the floor and, uh, you know, ends up back in the ceiling. And, and th those basically break off all of the crystals as they go but even then you're only getting two crystals from a piston breaking it versus 16 if you break it with fortune 3 and get lucky so i think it's it's kind of worth the manual approach at least in the early stages now before i've really got uh, a lot of access to slime and honey blocks to uh, to do it the manual way i believe on the citadel we have a fortune pick but i think it's a wooden pickaxe with mending yeah. and fortune <laughs> yeah i think to, to avoid like accidentally breaking any of the budding amethyst blocks and I think that area also has like a zombie spawner and a spider spawner. So repairing that pickaxe, it's like next to the geode, like it's immediately mm -hmm. right next door. So, but the tedious thing, of course, is that you're scaffolding up to various different nodes to harvest the amethyst because the water setup that I have currently there is just the floor is a giant water trap and it just kind of pushes everything to one side and collects yeah. it. The good news is it collects it and files it all into a, a storage system, but I could probably create a tank in there. Like if I, if I mm -hmm. wanted to bring the walls in or, or change the way that the water collection works, I could probably have a water trap across the top that would then dump all the amethyst shards into, uh, into the system but uh it if it works i i would even consider it if if even if it meant sacrificing a couple of nodes you know because yeah. uh like you like you it's a very big geo like yeah. there's a couple dozen nodes at least yeah the uh, the one i did in survival guide 2 was probably better than this it was smaller but it could fit in effectively like an eight block wide strip of water so that water streams across the top could reach all the way to the edge and so nice. i built i built a tank around that that was longer than eight blocks but definitely eight blocks wide and then yeah dumped uh, the shards over the side using um you know water streams and hoppers collecting them so that was that was doable but i, I wanted to go back with allays since they weren't an option when i set up the geode farm in season two and so i thought season three it'd be a, a good opportunity to uh, to introduce them um since then, I have worked on a 16-color wool farm with the usual, you know, sheep eat the grass block and observer detects it. That triggers a dispenser, and um, they're all just kind of in individual pods. And I always like building these farms because they're nice and easy. They teach a fairly fundamental set of interactions with redstone when it comes to both observers detecting block updates and uh, the fact that you can have a hopper minecart and a block occupy the same space. And so that's a really great introduction to some other mechanics that I can end up using. Um, I don't have a picture of it for the show notes, but I rigged up a dirt to mud converter as well, uh, because I wanted to talk about mud anyway and all the kind of fun properties that has. Um, I did a bit of, you know, terracotta farming effectively by turning it all into clay and then smelting it and dyeing the terracotta and then glazed terracotta out of that just to kind of show the the connections between that but i have tons of dirt left over from digging out the area for my storage system and there was too much to go in the storage system itself so i thought sure i'll, I'll convert some of this into uh into mud first and then the final thing i did this week was to set up my first iron farm in this world which right now is just a simple villager cell three villagers one zombie and you know however much iron that produces every 30 or 35 seconds they produce an iron golem and this time around, I built it on the ground instead of in the sky. So the iron golems are basically falling into a large pit instead of, you know, dropping from height uh, the way I did it previously. And it was a pretty easy setup. I found a really great way of catching a zombie in a cauldron by just flipping a trap door down over them, which is probably how I'm going to catch my zombies from this point onwards, actually. But uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of workshopped a couple of ideas for that. And I'm, I'm really happy with the iron farm setup now. That is really slick. I can't believe how small they are now. Yeah, yeah, they really are. And and all you need is yeah, a, a trap door uh, or a flower pot or something to block the villager's line of sight at night. And then a slab, uh, basically slot underneath that, uh, is, is empty just to make sure that the zombie can see them in the beds. And so they get up out of the beds immediately after they, they, they go to sleep. So yeah, the, there's, there's a lot of... Um, optimization i guess in in iron farms and there are some that you can make with very very few resources just look at like ray's works farm with the sort of v shape of beds and just a few water streams going into a pit with a single 
lava blocks suspended in there and there's there's so many different ways of making these things you know compact and and very usable but i kind of decided to to go my own way with it and to work with a design that i had figured out in survival guide season two but just kind of make it a little easier to build in season three i haven't even checked on our iron farm on the citadel in a very long time i know there was lots of storage uh the last time that i was there i think i made a lot of iron blocks leaving a lot of room for iron ingots but i've also been playing on the server a lot and it's in the spawn chunks so it's running even when I'm in West Hill and I haven't had to go specifically on a trip for iron in recent memory. Like mm -hmm. I could not tell you the last time I went. So unless other people have been there and it's in good shape or whatever, I actually, those kind of things are, are things I need to look into in case there's like a buildup of iron ingots. Cause that's a farm that we were using so frequently. Yeah. I don't think I built like an overflow. Uh, there is for things like the roses, and and other things that were garbage but like there's no overflow for like your iron is full <laughs> what happens with all of the iron ingots that are mm -hmm. floating around so actually that's a good reminder i should probably go check that out yeah i'm probably gonna install a filter for the poppies compost those or you know just gr grab yeah, as many of them as too. i feel like i'll need to with red dye and then i can kind of yeah store that for the foreseeable future but yeah it feels good to have an iron farm especially after all of the iron i spent on hoppers for the storage system and i keep running into uses for iron and technical builds that i want to do that it's just going to be a sensible thing to have an iron farm for the foreseeable future and of course a very sought after mechanic to make a video about so i'm uh, kind of enjoying having that around now we will get into listener email in just a second but it's worth noting that there is no snapshot for minecraft java edition 1.20.2 this week that was confirmed by slice lime on twitter on august 23rd Purely speculation on my part, but where Mojang has asked for player feedback on the villager trading adjustments, uh, there's no snapshot this week. And that may mean that they're reviewing feedback, they're working on testing out different ideas or implementing some changes. Um, I agree that these trading changes are probably on their way in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see if we see iterations on that in the snapshots going forward, or if there's just going to be minor tweaks, you know, like if it's going to be an overhaul, if it's going to be like a small thing here and there. Um, I still hope that there will be a snowball effect from the adjustment uh, and Mojang will make some changes to en uh, enchanting and that we may see some enchanting mechanics come into the snapshot as well as the villager trading adjustments. Yeah, yeah, I'm still seeing people talking about them online. Like, the, the most common question I feel like in my Twitch chat these days is, what do you think of the villager changes? And the debate usually rages on, and I haven't seen really that many compelling arguments against them implementing this. Um, the community is definitely not going to reach a consensus and everyone's going to agree on one specific thing. It's going to be a problem for some people and not a problem with others. And yeah, exactly. I think the main things I've seen people voices are sort of frustration that this isn't making anything easier. It's it's not it's removing one hassle and exchanging it for another hassle. You know, people who didn't like re-rolling lecterns over and over again are apparently equally predisposed to not like having to go and find a swamp and curing a zombie villager there um but the one thing i think people have been agreeing on is that changes to enchanted book trading should also be balanced by making the enchanting table better removing the level cap on combining tools some of the stuff that we talked about when the changes initially came through so yeah like you i'm interested to see if mojang are looking at any of the other mechanics here and there and this sort of led to the discussion topic that i'm going to bring to our round table a bit later on which is that obviously when mojang wants to revise mechanics like this they are also interested in keeping the challenge and most of the time when players look at these changes they see that as you know well you're not making it easier for us and i'm sort of wondering why players expect the game to become easier over time and at what point quality of life changes just become difficulty changes so we'll probably tackle that a little bit later on but uh, with no news to cover as such it's probably time to move on into chunk mail if you'd like to email the show and potentially share your ideas with us and uh, start a debate of your own here on the spawn chunks the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com keep them short and sweet and include a subject line so that we can understand what the email is about from the get-go like jw did who left us the subject why five minutes hey joel and johnny since the lighting changes there seems to be an uptick in conversation about the adjustments of legacy features in minecraft with the introduction of minor updates being included in the dot releases, there is now a system in place to enact such changes. The legacy feature I wonder about most is the 5 minute despawn time for item entities. 
Is there a reason behind this specific time limit, or is it an arbitrary time that has room to be adjusted? I understand entities need to despawn at some point to avoid lag, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on changing the 5 minute despawn time as a way of adding interesting game mechanics. What if Mojang added a smithing template that allowed Echo Shards to be combined with Diamond Armor, and tools adding a buff to these items similar to Netherite, except instead of Lava Protection the item would have Despawn Protection. This would also add synergy with the Recovery Compass, because now, no matter how long it takes, you could follow the compass to your most important items, not to mention the cool aesthetic opportunities and the appeal of Echo Armor. Always enjoy hearing your opinions. JW breathed a sigh of relief after recovering his favourite Echo Ho from an ancient city that wasn't quite cleared of Shriekers. I like that little line of <laughs> not quite cleared of Shriekers. Yes. Like, I thought I got them all, but then... There's always there... one. There's always one. <laughs> yeah. There, there was... Mistakes were made. Yes. Uh, I think this is a really neat idea that I don't think we'll see. Yeah, I kind I... of agree. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine the what if situation uh, or test that might happen at Mojang is when concepts like this come up, they have to take into consideration absent minded players that might lose or forget an item that will now never despawn as it floats in the world or the mechanic being used in ways other than intended, like someone making hundreds and hundreds of items in a way to just brute force and have these things around. Uh, that would cause performance issues and would either be unintended performance problems or performance problems that then, you know, you might see players blaming Mojang for a laggy game when it's really this feature not used as intended is causing problems. Now, I'm speaking speculatively because I don't know how that would affect it. I'm not that in tune with the under the hood of Minecraft, but I do know that a lot of entities can be a problem just from watching other videos i feel like there was a hermitcraft um situation a couple of years ago when there was a lot of items in a storage system that were causing a lot of problems for people the famous uh, uh, circular pumpkin which was yes <laughs> enough yeah. pumpkin entities building up in a farm that just ended i think melons were involved as well but it was just a ball yeah. of item entities <laughs> that kept stacking up and weren't despawning because more items kept getting added yeah so stuff like that i, I see as as a roadblock to this kind of thing now that said like instead of despawn protection, I like the idea of using an echo shard uh, as an enchantment. Uh, maybe it could do something like have your items make a sound or glow to make it easier to locate them with uh, a compass. Uh, what's it called? Not a, it's not an echo compass. What's a recovery the compass. Yeah. Recovery compass. They said it in the email. Yeah. So like the recovery compass could then point you to uh, those items a little bit easier. I know we can turn on visual hitboxes, uh, you know, as part of the debug stuff, but this could be a neat in-game feature that could cross both, you know, Bedrock and, and Java uh, and then be used for decoration later too. Like if you had the echo enchantment on a sword that was glowing, it would be really kind of cool to have that hanging on your wall in an item frame or from an armor stand. Like that kind of stuff could be neat, um, provided it was a aesthetic glow and not like a white line around it, you know, like the the um, glow arrows and stuff uh, do. I, I think that the other thing here is you you don't want to have a removal, as you just mentioned a few minutes ago, of the penalty for dying, right? Mm -hmm. Like there you, you can die in Minecraft as much as you want. And the only thing that happens is you, you get set back to wherever you last spawned. The only real uh, currency or or fee for dying is if the stuff goes into lava which there's now a thing for in the game that you can you know fix some of it uh or, or prevent some of it uh or you cannot get back to your death location in time and everything that you dropped to spawns including the stuff that's enchanted to not you know die in lava and i don't see them removing that it's interesting because they did at one point in the April Fool snapshot from this year, uh, which I went back to the Minecraft wiki to look this up, and it I was reminded of the fact that it was called 23W13A or B, which is still a really funny joke. Um, so if you if you delved into this at all, this was the voting update where you could effectively vote every few minutes to add or change 
aspects of the the game rules that dictate the world and biome colors and silly stuff like whether cheese blocks were in the game or not that kind of thing but one of the things you could vote on was whether or not items despawned if dropped on the ground or if they just stayed there in perpetuity and also the item despawn timer uh, which could be changed from five minutes to whatever random amount it generated so yeah that that was actually something that the team has had in the back of their minds potentially and maybe the kind of things that they've experimented with behind the scenes changing game rules and seeing whether or not that has really been holding players back or you know at least they they have the option to change it do they choose to change it i, I think it's it's a, a fun side experiment almost of that snapshot that we we got to see how players would react to some of those things actually being in the game um so i'm not going to say that we'd never see it because it's clearly something they have considered at some stage but i don't know whether or not this feels like the type of solution they would go to and whether it still yeah feels like a a legacy feature that they would respect in the same way that like stack sizes are an arbitrary thing but it's become one of those iconic things about minecraft you, you your items stack to 64 and they despawn after five minutes if you drop them that's sort of the yeah the, the, the rules i suppose but they change lighting and and how that relates to mob spawns so yep. potentially that's another thing that could be on the chopping block in future um yeah the, the thing that compels me about jw's idea is the synergy with recovery compass echo shards things like much as obviously we've had a lot of suggestions in the past about what could be done with the echo shards i love the idea of it almost being the inverse of curse of vanishing um where you know a, an item that if you die it just disappears from your inventory entirely i do like the idea of there being an item that when it drops from your inventory remains in the world and the echo nature of that makes a lot of sense to me would add a lot of value to echo shards for players because i can imagine a lot of people wanting some sort of despawn protection on their armor regardless of whether or not they're an accident prone player and expected any of that stuff to uh, to be disappeared but also for mini games you know you have the 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 opportunity to create server mini games in which your items can't just be lost if you drop them so you can go into a pvp mini game wearing your full set of armor and not expect it to just be gone by the end of the game uh I, th I think there is potential for that stuff to be really handy for players and something like echo shards that are a fairly risky item to get if you aren't that familiar with ancient cities i think that could still be a pretty viable use of um a whatever you'd call it like a non-renewable item of, a, of a, a rare item in this game to uh to provide that kind of functionality i think it might be worth it i could also see this being tied to something like enchanting so in trying to think of a way to have a item specifically so not all items but having a, a item like a pickaxe that you drop because you died not be the same as an entity item hovering on the ground i wonder if there could be something added to uh, a tool or something and and have it be weighted so it's a weighted pickaxe so when you drop it it sticks in the ground like a block would you know like it drops as if you've placed it as a player so mm -hmm. instead of floating around and spinning it's actually a model of a pickaxe that's like stuck in the ground and because it's weighted it won't despawn it's now no different than a grass block as far as you know the the game is concerned you just have to go find this pickaxe and pick it up you end up you know dying in a specific spot so that it sticks in the ground and you can make that a monument in the center of your village or whatever then yeah like i can i can see that happening that seems like kind of a fun a fun mechanic to add to it but yeah i i do think there is room for mechanics like this to be played around with and i think that's the takeaway from this discussion in general is that all bets are off really after they've started adjusting things like um you know mob spawning in complete darkness instead of light level seven and below any of those mechanics could ultimately be on the chopping block mojang just has to decide or the players have to come up with a compelling reason for uh why it should be changed and what the alternative is and so i think like there are neat mechanical ways that you can incorporate existing items and kind of have some respect for those mechanics whilst also working away uh, at ways that players can work around those mechanics i think it's kind of a fun a fun thought experiment our next email comes in from dragon master dan deep dark mending hi joel and johnny 
I'm a longtime listener, been around since episode 130, and I've listened to all prior episodes as well, and I finally found a reason to write in. While listening to your discussion in episode 259 on mending and how to potentially change it to make it accessible to all, while still challenging for those who want to try and rush it, what about utilizing the deep dark? I was thinking mending could either be found in a loot chest item, either a template or just a book, or a crafting recipe with echo shards and amethyst. Where amethyst is currently being used to calibrate Skulk sensors, why not use these with echo shards to make your tool or armor quote unquote resonate with experience orbs? For crafting, I was thinking of amethyst in the corners, echo shards in the cardinal directions, with a bottle of enchanting in the middle to create a new item like a quote-unquote calibrated shard that can be added to tools and armor in the smithing table. This can be taken further to add control to enchanting, maybe replace the bottle of enchanting with TNT to calibrate blast protection, a cactus for thorns, etc. This way, enchanting can be random and get your progression wise to the point where you can make it through the deep track safely and gain control over your enchants. What do you think? Dragon Master Dan was sonic boomed out of the ancient city by a warden because his armor wasn't calibrated correctly, but at least he used chicken feathers in his boots for feather falling and survived. (laughs) Having chicken feathers like the wings of Hermes. I like it. Um, No, I I think this is sort of tying into what I had as an idea for the discussion is that this would seem like a lot of work being put into what is effectively a sideways move in how we treat enchantments right now because everybody is currently used to getting mending from villagers but it just being a bit of a hassle to work with i think you would have a much harder time convincing players that in order to have control over mending they needed to go to the deep dark when i've certainly heard a decent handful of players say i'm not interested in doing the whole deep dark warden thing at all i just don't find it especially compelling and i don't want to risk losing all of my equipment and that kind of stuff so for the more careful players out there i think this mechanic just being either inaccessible to them through necessity or through just a lack of enthusiasm for the uh, for the mechanics at play i think that'd be kind of a difficult pill to swallow um and and as an afterthought to the previous email thinking about you know an item that sticks in place if you died and makes a really cool um you know monument of some kind that'd be another mechanic that hardcore players were effectively locked out of right so considering different people's play styles it kind of makes it a, a a difficult issue if suddenly the deep dark is the key to having any kind of level of control over your enchantments yeah i agree i I think that if it was to be in the game it would have to be in addition to the way that you get mending now and people would just choose tackle the deep dark or wrangle villagers whichever is your you know least pain point yeah in that that road uh because some players like you said might dislike the deep dark and or just find it too difficult you know like it just it might be something that just they don't have time for because they're a busy adult they don't want to die over and over again in the death loop and just get really frustrated and, and not have fun and i think that's the thing is that mojang has to implement the changes to these things in a way that still allow players to have fun um or at least avoid the opposite which is frustration right if, if you don't particularly like the new mechanic it's it's okay if you're not really frustrated with it like if it causes you to to really dislike the game loop then i think that they have to be careful with that i mean you're not going to be able to please everybody all the time of course but um i think i like the idea of having more than one way to get it though you know like in the same yeah. way that there's more that if you want to create an xp farm there's a number of different ways that you can do it you just choose the one that appeals to you uh and i think that this is the kind of thing where Right now, you know, you can you get the mending book from the villagers in the way that they've got it set up. But if they added more to it, I th- I think that could be interesting to allow players that choice. You know, um, I I did like the idea of resonance, though. Uh, the crafting example is a little bit convoluted. I think maybe I always find those full nine by nine grid kind of recipes to be a little bit over the top, you know. And I kind of wonder whether just like a bottle of enchanting and an echo shard would be enough, you know, just just create the thing. I mean, either way, an echo shard being used in the duplication of a mending template, which I like the idea of a mending template. I think that that creates a more interesting way of doing it. Like you could go to your villagers and get books 
and have to repeat that process or you can do the deep dark thing once and get the template and then use diamonds and uh an echo shard to then uh duplicate the mending enchantment template you know like that kind of a thing i can i see templates as having a lot of potential down the line for more than just decorative armor stuff i i think they could use it for a bunch of different things and i'm very curious to see if they do pull the trigger on that but we're definitely seeing another chunk mail inbox trend lately of echo shards being used <laughs> yeah by players uh it, well i think that here's what it is like there's uh, a, a new option or there's a need for something to change in the game and I, I feel like the players that are writing in and asking for something new to be added are being careful not to ask for the moon so it's like well here's a really cool idea for adding like a mending template and hey look there's already this item in the game that doesn't really do much <laughs> so yeah. why not use that so you don't have to create a new item mojang just like Here's my idea. You know, I can see how it makes it more appealing. And I I do like the idea of new things being added to the game that then utilize items that have been in the game forever, you know, uh, like feeding cactus to camels, you know, like it gives another reason to have a cactus farm. And like those kind of things are good. I think it really helps with the uh, interweaving of Minecraft items and mechanics when they use existing items that either don't have a lot of functions or just make sense to to be used in the new in the new mechanic whatever they're introducing yeah i i do wonder and i know it is typically their modus operandi to um introduce features like this and look at community speculation for for things like echo shards where they don't really have much purpose beyond the recovery compass right now and maybe they're waiting to see which way the wind blows on certain features but i like to imagine that someone one of the gameplay developers at mojang and in my head it's probably Ulraf, is just there rubbing their hands together thinking you don't know what's coming next <laughs> they've got <laughs> ideas for them already and they're just waiting to see the the payoff once players who've written in with all of these lovely echo shard ideas many of which have been really really cool to read um once they finally figure out what echo shards are really for i don't know why i'm singling out Ulraf. apologies to Ulraf, but i think he he seems like the rubbing his hands together kind of guy <laughs> so we'll <laughs> we'll see the 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 true villain of mojang was was there all along moving into this week's round table uh johnny and i each have separate topics and uh, johnny's actually ties into something we talked about earlier with the game being uh, a little bit easier or the desire for the game to become easier over time so why don't we start with that yeah so it's just a, a thought that occurred to me whilst we were discussing some of these villager changes and the idea that over time you sort of expect legacy features like uh, features from older updates to either have additional ways to use them or to become more available to you um and so take take for example the change in getting small drip leaf from the wandering trader in 117 to finally having lush caves implemented in 118 and suddenly small drip leaf is everywhere so if you're interested in getting hold of that stuff you could you could use it um th there are a few other examples of this uh, recently i was thinking about ocean monuments and how much easier they have been since the advent of swimming as a mechanic because you're now able to get through one block wide holes whether horizontally or vertically which was not something players could do back when all we could do was float around in a vertical orientation so you couldn't swim through and under some of those you know structures in the rooms that are built out with this framework of prismarine and so it was harder to get away from guardians shooting lasers at you at the time even if you had depth stride and whatever else and so that wasn't necessarily a move by mojang to make ocean monuments specifically easier but this trend has been created of older things becoming easier or almost being made obsolete by new additions to the game and then stuff comes along like smithing templates being a requirement to upgrade to nether right now and this transposition of certain specific villager trades onto villagers which are typically a little harder to come by because they are from unusual biomes or biomes where villagers don't naturally generate and a little bit more effort and exploration is required from the player in order to get a reliable source of that which is in many people's view not as easy as or is you know harder than the uh the situation that we have right now where you just find one villager and re-roll a lecture a few times and so i'm wondering if 
this is a precedent that's been set by changes Mojang have made, or if it's simply a facet of video games culture in general, that as a game sees more and more updates, we expect the newer features to become the harder ones and the older features to get gradually easier as more levels of power and that sort of power creep takes over. Um, I'm thinking of examples like Terraria, for example, where every time they add like a new final boss or, you know, yeah, in MMOs, a Scotsman mentioned that in our live chat, it's a very good example of, you know, them adding a new dungeon to the game and increasing power level caps. And so when you go back and do older dungeons or whatever, it becomes a lot easier for you to just roll through the things that were a challenge in the early game. And technical progression like that has never been a huge part of Minecraft. You obviously have the tool progression from wood through to netherite, but Mojang don't feel the need to really upgrade the player much beyond that point and beyond the point of enchanting because there aren't really too many higher scaled areas in the game. Even stuff like the Warden, the whole point is not to kill it. So it's it's interesting to me that players seem to expect the game to become easier for them over time and expect those mechanics to be more easily accessible over time when realistically Mojang can rebalance the game to make certain things a bit more of a, if not a hassle to get, then a bit more of a challenge and hopefully introduce some rewarding gameplay as a result. I think some of it is the mix-up of having the gameplay mentality of going through the progression in Minecraft or any other RPG, uh, Scotsman mentioned MMOs, uh, and having that power pro progression be you want to feel more powerful the longer you're playing the game. So you want that to continue up in a, in a trajectory, right? But in game development, that's not always the case, right? Like, so be, just because Minecraft is an ongoing game, it doesn't or shouldn't, I guess, have to have the same trajectory as the player experience, which is to get you know, as you said, more geared up, you know, you get a better understanding of your surroundings, you no longer have to forge for food, like you get through all those things. And I think the other side of that is a bit of the players that play Minecraft for longer periods of time. And I don't know whether this is just a vocal minority, but rather than the folks that reset all the time and have to go through all of the early game things, folks like me that have been on a server for six years, look at some of these older mechanics as tedious because you know we've gotten past them or we feel like we've gotten past them and yet on certain things we just we have to go back and wrangle villagers or we have to go back and and do these things that that drive us crazy uh i think there was a video from cub fan a while ago talking about i think it was the lighting in minecraft and, and the lack of control and he was saying that it feels so strange to be netherite armor rocket flying around the world and yet we can't control light in the most basic of ways you know in order to control mobs you know and i think at that point he's even suggested like beacon abilities to then remove mobs from your surrounding area like that kind of a thing because he felt after long times in minecraft worlds you should have more power and more control and I think if I recall our discussion on that, it was like the it was the the player that had surpassed all of the challenges. And now the challenges are nuisances. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're right in that Mojang has to walk that line between like, well, we don't want to remove all the challenge for people that are just starting the game. And then we want to add more challenge for people that have been playing the game for a while so that these nuisances are no longer nuisances. They're actually still gameplay and, and have to be contended with. But I think there's that weird balance in Minecraft because it's got that creative aspect where there are players like me that really just don't want to deal with mobs. Like I'd rather just build, but I don't want to play creative. Like I like the gameplay of survival, collecting, you know, doing all of that and cool farms where you have to farm mobs. So I don't want mobs to not exist. I don't want to play in peaceful mode. But I also don't want to float around with every block at my disposal infinitely either. Like that's not, I don't find that fun either. So I'm always in this weird spot of like only engaging most of the time with some mechanics in Minecraft, but not all of them. And I guess that might make me more of a, a laid back player where like a lot of my 
feedback about the game is about how it looks and what blocks we have and how we can make all that work together. And I have very little feedback usually about about mobs. I think the only thing where I was, you know, jumping up and down was the the, the change in lighting because again, it, it affected my builds positively. But I never even looked that hard at how it affected mob farms. Like we haven't checked any of that kind of stuff on the server. Like if we have any dark room farms, like I've don't no idea if they're still working. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I I think it's it's odd to think of certain styles of Minecraft gameplay resulting in players thinking of some aspects of this game as chores, <laughs> but that's part of it, right? Like you think about clearing mobs out of an area, you're disinterested in it for the most part. Like you might have to engage with it for the sake of cleaning up creepers just to make sure that they don't mess with your builds after you've been a little bit late getting to bed on one of these sort of evenings. But it's so strange to me that in a game like this, there are going to be so many different play styles that some people might just consider this stuff means to an end and, and frustrating and boring but still be interested in playing the game for the aspects that engage them fully you know <laughs> the, the the folks who probably just want to build a cobblestone box so they have some safe place to sleep the night in before they go out and explore their entire world or before they you know die wolf 20 style dive into all of the mods or all of the redstone that they want to do they just need like a single seven by seven cobblestone room that they can plan the rest of their you know redstone supercomputers in and i think it's so interesting that those players don't necessarily consider that the game could pivot in that direction for them or that they could find something to like about it instead it just becomes a frustration that is you know dealt with by the shortest possible means um to make it the least possible you know inconvenience to them before they they carry on with the rest of their stuff the nookie in our live chat is comparing it to world of warcraft where in that game they control that with one player fixed data set which is your player level uh, and that stays with the player. It's fixed. It doesn't disappear like levels in Minecraft. And that applies to a game that's like heavily combat focused. But some of the difficulty that I think Johnny's getting at in Minecraft is not just like the, the survival gameplay. It's also like the effort required to go and get certain things or take care of certain tasks, you know, clear ocean monuments, like that kind of stuff. It's not just about you know combat although it would be very interesting if minecraft actually implemented like a level system where like the longer you lived without dying the higher your level would be and it would actually affect how you interact with the world like higher survivability you're not as hungry as often you know you, you zombies and skeletons and creepers are much easier to deal with if you're like a level 11 versus a level 2 like that kind of a thing and it would reset every time you you know you died uh, and it would affect your actual interaction. I think it would be mayhem in PvP. I don't think that would work at all. But like, <laughs> yeah, I, you yeah. know, like there's there's all these different things about Minecraft that you have to balance, right? I think that the other curious thing about Minecraft is that the difficulty scaling actually applies to so few things on the grand scale mm. of mm -hmm. what Minecraft is because difficulty can be adjusted once you're already in the world so it can have so little effect over your environment. Instead, it affects things like mob damage, occasionally mob health, uh, the accuracy of skeleton bows and pillager crossbows and like a few other things like that but it's not necessarily scaling the difficulty of how hard it is to achieve certain results you know it's not you know, playing the game on easy doesn't mean you get more diamonds from diamond ore for example and you know that can often be a, a, a struggle or like a sort of an interesting facet of it that other games might make those things easier by virtue of there being any kind of difficulty levels to begin with but minecraft is not that kind of game like the resource thing happens the same for everybody um the amount of mobs that spawn even happen the same for everybody it's just that they do less damage on easy um and, and it's it's such a an odd thing um mind trip media in our chat said uh, i spent time trying to make things easier for me later on and mechanics that undo that are frustrating well here is the thing if you're in an established world and you're trying to make things easy for, your, for yourself later on, anybody who is, you know, annoyed at the changes to villagers just needs to get an entire group of villagers who all have those trades now and they're good for the foreseeable future. It's the fact that 
those players are foreseeing a time in which they will need to reset their world or the server that they are playing on resets and they move on and then they are faced with a new set of mechanics that they have to inter have to interact with at that stage but you're starting from square one anyway so you would still have to build up infrastructure i just think it's it's interesting that once players are used to that level of convenience in their world they want to skip a lot of the early game grind to get there and it, you feel sort of less compelled to put in the work to reach that point again and and so that's that's an interesting uh, aspect of it for me but i am i'm kind of <laughs> kind of curious what people think about you know the game feeling easier over time but is that something that we expect or is that something that you think mojang has a job of rebalancing as players get used to the ease of legacy features and and with stuff like mending as an example but not necessarily an exclusive example well speaking of difficulty i have had a heck of a time in my search to replace the tables and chairs data pack for the citadel i found the decision to choose which mod to implement or data pack to implement as well as just the volume of stuff included in each mod to be just a little bit overwhelming. And I'm not looking at all mods, I'm looking at just furniture mods, like just decorative stuff. And so I feel like I've spoken about this a number of times on the show in the last kind of few weeks with our weekly updates about what we've been doing in Minecraft. So I, w I thought I would just air it all out now and not repeat myself on the show and just kind of figure out, you know, uh, and ask kind of like how might be the best way to go about this. Cause I'm, I'm not really sure. So, looking at these furniture mods a lot of times they have some really cool things in them but then they add a ton of other stuff that we either don't need on the server or it starts to feel giant air quotes here too modded you know like i want tables and chairs i don't necessarily want blenders you know and <laughs> yeah, frying yeah. pans and and very often you'll have this weird mix where like the table and the chair will be like oh those look really vanilla minecraft like they're made of oak they have the same oak wood texture maybe there's a flat tabletop that's like you know the the stripped wood texture or something like that they're subtle they're usually very classic looking but then your blender might like have 128 pixel resolution and not look like anything in minecraft whatsoever like it really just feels like a voxel from a different voxel game and that's the stuff where I find it really frustrating in that do I add the one furniture mod that has the things that I want? Uh, a good example is Paladin's furniture mod heavily on the medieval type style, which is what I'm looking at it for right now. But we also have Southport, the modern city on the Citadel, and it would be nice to have modern looking clean chairs. And I wouldn't argue if a furniture mod also had a fridge, you know, uh, because there's not a real easy way to do that in Minecraft and not have it look like a bunch of weird Minecraft pieces stuck together. Um, little things sometimes, like instead of using a cauldron and a lever, I could just use a sink. Like a sink model would be nice in the modern city. And so I'm trying to skirt this line between having a lot of mods on the Citadel that are, are performance related, they're UI related, and very few that affect gameplay uh, and trying to keep it in the vanilla plus range because technically it's a modded server, but we really often refer to it as like vanilla gameplay, at least in spirit. And I'm trying to figure out like what's the best course of action to take here because there are some mods that are, are looking really cool. Like Mr. Crayfish's furniture mod is really cool. Paladins I've mentioned. Uh, there's also something that I, I've seen from a, a couple of other people in Twitch chat, which was called supplementaries. But that really goes beyond what I would consider vanilla plus, because that adds all the kind of things that I was even talking about last week with like you can put lanterns on the side of things. And it starts to add just a lot of stuff that is on a wish list for sure from from Mojang. But it just sort of feels like the I don't know, I don't want my gameplay experience to be like. I don't feel that Minecraft is good enough because I do. Uh, I therefore I fixed it, you know. And I find that sometimes the these mods have that kind of vibe where like Minecraft wasn't enough for me, so I've made this other thing and it's better, you know. And I still mostly because I the way that I I do this show, like I want to have a very 
close vanilla experience. So when we're talking about new blocks or we're talking about different effects that we can achieve, I also want to have that challenge. Like I don't want a bunch of neon lights that allow me to just make neon lights. I would much rather be more inventive with, you know, how I might be able to create those. So I've got this weird kind of fight that's happening in my head. And I feel like I, while I'm not throwing any shade at mod authors here, I also don't want to get into the frustration of finding a mod that I really like, but then it hasn't been updated to the latest version of Minecraft, even though it's been months, you know, or uh, having a mod or a data pack that's no longer supported or changes the way that it works. Um, one of the reasons behind all of this is that the tables and chairs data pack needed to be changed because data packs were changed in how they functioned. But in order for me to update to the new versions of tables and chairs, it means replacing every single table and chair in West Hill. It's been three years. I don't want to replace all the tables and chairs in West Hill if I can avoid it at all. Mm -hmm. So there's that, that sort of like push and pull in my brain. And the other thing is that like, I'm very specific in the kinds of things that I want. I'm looking for vanilla esque furniture. I am not looking for stuff that's too over the top. And I've been, been considering making my own mod, which has the same time sink as trying to keep a, a mod updated that is made by somebody else. But it gives me the control. Like all of a sudden, if I'm the one controlling what models are in it, then I can say the modern furniture is going to look like vanilla furniture. The medieval furniture is going to look as vanilla as possible. And that dr brought me to a place where I was thinking like, well, what if we just went over the top and included th something like supplementaries or included something like chisels and bits, which is now available for fabric. And then I could just use the player challenge concept that we we talked about a few weeks ago on the show and just make sure that anything that is created with chisels and bits would be vanilla esque and not have that sub sub block resolution. Like it would be 16 by 16. Everything would be very blocky. I would probably find it a really fun design challenge as an artist to, you know, make a coffee mug that looks like a cube, you know, and, mm -hmm. and have that feel like Minecraft and things like that in the cafes, you know, uh, in the, the modern city would be great. But then like, where do I draw the line? Like, I don't want to make a chandelier for the, you know, medieval town. Um, I don't want to get into making wall sconces, even though I could. And it's just, it's going to be difficult if I go down that road of like, where do I draw the line? And the good news is of, you know, with regards to something like chisels and bits is that it's a fairly well received mod. It's usually updated, you know, frequently. Uh, I don't know what it's like for performance because I haven't looked into it that much, but I, I don't know where the line is. And we do have other mods on the server that we just use the bare bones, despite the fact that they're capable of much more. Zero's map and mini map are a really good example. You can turn on like little radars and find out where all the creepers are. You can turn on slime chunks. You can, you know, you can teleport. You can create waypoints on that map. And we don't use it for that. I just use it for a top down view of my world. And that's it. And and I and I think I there's like there's a couple of things in the mini map that there's like a clock, like time of day. And that for me is just really helpful when I want to sleep while I'm streaming. So I'm not like waiting for, you know, whenever. You know, it's 1832 is when I can jump into bed and switch it over to, to daytime. Um, I find I use that more for like a quality stream experience rather than, you know, my own gameplay. Uh, I think that that's possible. Like I, I we we have avoided the temptation of using, you know, Zero's map to teleport around. So um, it's possible that these things could be um dealt with and have like maybe a charter that applies to to the different furniture mods but the question that i had for you specifically because i know that you've played on some servers that have mods and or have like vanilla plus custom mods and stuff like that when you're deciding to choose a mod or you're part of a server where mar mods are being implemented what are the criteria that you find are used in those decisions it's a difficult one because i've never really chosen to work with mods myself in terms of like having a single player world that i added mods to or a multiplayer server where i was compiling the mod pack those things were usually sort of decided for me or decided by committee um oh, so I see. so i've never really like been the the sole individual responsible for setting up mods but uh with empires i think is probably the the most 
worthwhile example and new life is obviously an example but that's more like a kitchen sink kind of pack in terms of all of the stuff that's that's in there on empires we had a line that we drew which was it has to be cosmetic and it has to feel like it lines up enough with vanilla or it has to be justified in the story that you are telling and we didn't use anything that modified vanilla game mechanics it was still very much a 1.19 series so the main things that we had mod wise were cosmetic things that changed item entities and that was mostly for horses so that each of us could have a unique mount i could have my dodo Fwip could have his giant boar uh, you know various things like that shovel had a massive frog which was very good but those were all just horses mechanically speaking they were the same the animations were different they were custom made for us by six foot blue who's a fantastic uh, pixel artist and and animator but we really stuck to really one person or like you know a couple of other trusted individuals making changes to very specific entities for us and then a bit of texture pack stuff like whips foliage texture pack was in there with a few other customized things and we just updated that with all of the extra information that was running behind the scenes for the custom entity models mod and so that allowed us to do a few extra things like make jimmy really small for the arc where he was supposed to be the toy sheriff and so forth like the, the kind of jokes we were doing around that but that was all all cosmetic didn't really affect gameplay functionality and i think that's really where i tend to draw the line and where you're obviously drawing the line when it comes to gameplay on the citadel because if it comes to just having a chair to sit in well you can make one of those out of you know uh, a set of stairs if you're at your most basic but also you can put a minecart in a block and sort of sit on that you can merge some stairs with a block that contains a minecart and still find an area that you can click on and it just looks like a chair with a weird tray sticking out of it you know there are a few compromises that you can make there so why not make that look a little bit more realistic by simply moving that functionality onto a mod that just adds chairs that you can sit on or tables that you can put items on the way you can item frames those mechanics already exist in the vanilla game you are just making them a little bit more palatable to the modern eye and requiring you to suspend your disbelief less when it comes to the decoration of areas like a medieval city so i think that in my book would just be like fine this doesn't really feel too modded unless like you said it gets into stuff like blenders and whatnot that if anything would draw attention to themselves not because they were a mod but because they felt out of place for the setting you're working with right um yeah so i, th I think that's sort of where i would draw the line where i tend to think of gameplay as more modded and where it leaves the vanilla side of things is if it adds new systems or it adds new ways of like even like crafting recipes i don't really mind that much anymore because data packs exist to perform that function it's when yeah. you add new crafting tables and block models that don't really feel like they fit the vanilla palette and suddenly you have a system like chipped or chisel where you can turn any block in whatever family into something that's got the same template as say like as a sandstone block but you can have the sandstone pattern on stone or purple or deep slates or whatever right and just modifying the color palette of existing blocks and i've seen several that just add an entire range of blocks that don't even have that sort of template for the block in the game so there are all kinds of different like pillar additions and and detailed and chiseled right. additions and stuff for every single range of blocks from purple through to diorite through to calcite and whatever else and and i think those start to feel like well you're not working with vanilla anymore because you are adding in so much more detail than the vanilla game offers you and the creative offering of the vanilla game is one that you have to compromise on exactly what you wanted in order to let your imagination fill in the blanks a little bit and that's where i get on the fence about like chisels and bits especially for something like the modern city because i could see myself going down a rabbit hole where i could create a very cool looking still you know in the same resolution of of vanilla minecraft uh kitchen you know with a faucet and a stove and a fridge and cupboards and things like that in the way that i would want them to be uh and it would be very satisfying but 
in that way it's because nothing in that resolution exists in minecraft like there's no countertops there's no like no, there's no platform in minecraft that's like one pixel wide you know what i mean yeah like and i i could see that being a, a really tempting thing i mean obviously we'd have to try to have some restrictions on it and you know try to say okay well if you're going to do this like you can only work in half block increments like it either has to be as tall as a block or as tall as a slab you know like you have to work in that kind of way but um i forget that things like chisels and bits have the ability to just reskin a block like it's not yeah. just about creating like a, a chair out of like a new block model it's about creating you could do just about anything uh with this mod and i think that's the problem with some of the other mods that i have where as an artist i'm then at the behest of whatever that person feels is the best way to design a chair the best texture for a chair that kind of stuff and if i don't like it then is it easy for me to change it do i want to bother to change it because when they update the new version will my all the hard work that i made into changing a couple of chairs to look like modern furniture it does that then no longer work on the new version of the mod pack you know so like it's one of those things where like you get into this rabbit hole of creating way more work for yourself than you ever intended and uh it's it's been an an education looking into this and i'm still not entirely sure which way i'm going to go um i feel like it might come down to just adding one or two mods that have the furniture in it that we find appealing as a server but then also saying like hey look we're not going to use this for adding rope and blenders and like whatever else is in there that just isn't you know part of it i also need to do a lot of testing because i find that even with youtube videos you really don't get a an idea of just how many things you, you'll see oh here's a showcase of a couple dozen items but then you do research and the the mod will have a thousand new things in minecraft mm -hmm. it's like oh my gosh like i don't know if i want to go down that road you know um, and what happens if we get into a mod start using it for furniture and then realizing, oh, we really don't like this mod because of the other features that we don't know exist. Well, then you're done and you have to like remove the mod and then remove all the work that you've done with the mod. And I don't know, it's data packs in a way feel a lot lighter. They like they, they tend to do one thing, right? Rather than mods, even a singular furniture <laughs> mod tends to do a number of things. Whereas a furniture data pack seems to do one thing. Like it just tables and chairs, you know, and, and same with recipe data packs, you know, like, as you mentioned before, like they tend to do one thing. You don't really have a data pack that has a number of different functions. Normally people have to implement a number of different data packs to get the things that they want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, th I think mods can sometimes feel like overkill in a pretty big way. Um, yeah. ju just looking at the description for chipped, like it says it adds over 9,000 unique building blocks. And I'm like, that's too much for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I really like what they've done with stained glass, but they've also added 15 different stained glass designs for all 16 colors plus clear glass. And I just think I wouldn't need all of those. I just want no. one that makes it look slightly more medieval for this pub I'm building, you know? And so, yeah, yeah you, you so often end up running down the, a, a huge rabbit hole with that stuff. And if it's a mod that you can disable certain things, if you can cut some bits off of it and just be left with the stuff That's that you've got, if too. it's modular, um, I think Vasky does a really great job of their mod packs whenever like building stuff out like that. There's so many things where you can disable certain features and just kind of pick and choose what you want there's just you know a, a set of boxes you can check or you know folders you can delete even if it means making things a little bit simpler but yeah i i think there's there's definitely a point at which it just strays over into stuff you won't need and that's the point where i reconsider whether i needed a mod for it in the first place it it ends up being more work than you feel like it's going to be worth in the long run yes yeah absolutely that's sort of the way it goes and maybe some people feel that way about mending books now <laughs> that's 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 where we're looking at uh but folks i think we're probably going to wrap things up there would be really interested to see if anybody out there has any input on these two discussions though so send your emails into spawnchunkmail at gmail.com if you want to contribute to these discussions and it'd be great to hear from some folks in the community but that's where we're going to leave things for today thank you so much for listening to the spawn chunks you can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we talked about today at thespawnchunks.com 
gmail.com. The music for the show is composed by me, and we are proud as ever to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can visit patreon.com slash the spawn chunks to join our community, where pledging at any level will get you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat, and you can listen to the show live when it's recorded every Monday. We have monthly Minecraft audio hangouts where our patron community uh, shares stuff that they've been working on in Minecraft over the last month or so. We currently have 324 patrons where we're welcoming an additional two since last week. Special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons, Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager, and Yitz. Thank you all for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just tell a friend about the show and that they can listen on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and even YouTube. Be sure to leave a rating or a review on your favorite platform. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is linked at the spawnchunks.com. And the Patreon-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the Render Distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, Bottom Line, I go by Pixorifs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixorifs, where the Minecraft Survival Guide is currently in its third season. I stream three days a week on Twitch, which is going to be disrupted over the next week thanks to a trip to Europe, but I'll be back in the hot seat right after that and doing behind-the-scenes work for my YouTube series. I'm also the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. And aside from that, I'm at Pixorifs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I'm doing online can be found at joelduggan.com, including a link to the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. I'm Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Thursday through Sunday, building the Citadel Minecraft server on the weekends and Lego on Fridays. But coming up in September, Starfield. Starfield is coming, and I'm going to be playing Starfield on Twitch. So check that out. That's going to be happening starting September 5th. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, and this table was only round because of mods. <laughs>